But today, I want to really talk about what's going on in the marketplace that's benefiting Linux uh, outside of kind of what the technical things that are going on within Linux, which I think you'll get a full flavor of this week. But I want to talk about how big shifts in the technology landscape are really favoring Linux and open source. Now, these big shifts in the tech landscape are things that I think everybody knows about. But I think it's interesting to see how they're now relating to Linux and open source. I think everybody knows that the most popular topic today in terms of the changing IT landscape is the shift towards cloud computing. Cloud computing is going to have this amazing impact. And I know everybody realizes that this is a big shift. But I wanted to put it in perspective at just how big a shift this is. IDC predicts that the spending on cloud services is growing at five times the rate of the IT industry. There was a recent report that I saw that mentioned that on just one cloud instance, Amazon Public Cloud, Amazon Web Services, for every dollar spent on AWS, three to four dollars of traditional IT spending, buying servers, software, and so forth, just disappears. That's a tremendous shift in the landscape. But why is that important for Linux? Because free and open source software is really fueling all of this huge software as a service movement. In fact, we looked around. We, I, I asked some of my staff to go look at just how big Linux is in public clouds and software as a service. And we were really hard pressed to find a public infrastructure as a service cloud that wasn't running Linux. In fact, we only found one. Can anyone guess who, which one that might have been? Azure. You got it, exactly. <laughs> Microsoft Azure, of course, is uh, not running Linux. But to, to give you a perspective of just how important free and open source software is for this sort of new era of cloud-based, hyperscale, scale-out computing. Something interesting I thought of just as I was coming down here relates to Twitter. Everybody knows that Twitter is going public, right? This is now going to be one of the most anticipated technology IPOs, really, of this year. And what's interesting is most of Twitter's infrastructure, most of their software, is open source. I checked uh, just this morning. They have 100 repos on GitHub just of Twitter software that they use to run Twitter. This isn't you know, Linux and all the other things that are used to run Twitter. Uh, they have actually uh, a Chris. I don't know if Chris is here this week. But they have a special group whose job is really to open source most of the technology that runs Twitter. So as we shift towards this new cloud sort of web scale computing, you know, Twitter doesn't see the software that they use to build their service as their big differentiator, right? They just want it to be efficient, scalable, affordable. And so they not only use open source software, but they release most of it as open source software. Uh, I think they hire 10, 15% of their engineering staff from people who work on Twitter-related open source projects, who just come in as volunteers. So you can see this sort of web scale computing model is really helping move Linux and open source software forward. In fact, this web and, and scale and sort of hyperscale computing model is really changing the entire server industry. right? Some of the top computer makers now in the US are not actually computer makers. They're companies like Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And on all of those servers is Linux and open source. In fact, in enterprise computing, oops, we're really getting down to a two-horse race, where Linux is becoming the, not only the fastest growing platform, but the de facto platform for new greenfield deployments. Windows also continues to grow, but Unix is really now being completely replaced by Linux. 
So you see in hyperscale environments, in cloud environments, Linux open source is really the core of how that is being created. In addition, a big trend towards a web-centric application model is favoring Linux and open source. You know, IDC predicts that by 2015, 80% of mobile apps will at least partially be based on HTML5. You know, I always say every time somebody builds an app, the web dies just a little bit. But uh, HTML5 is clearly a, centered around this service delivery model where you have a better way to deploy, secure, and maintain software. You know, we, we have a little regression to client server and mobile and Objective C and certain platforms, but I think what you're going to see and what everyone is seeing in the market these days is a move towards that web centric model where you build an app, it's delivered on anything. It could be a television, it could be a phone, it could be a tablet, it could be a wide variety of things. And what that is really doing is creating an end of an OS era. Really decoupling the OS from the primary development environments that you see out there. And we're really now seeing the Windows and Win API era sort of closing down. But what's interesting here is how there's a new network effect that's scaling this cloud-centric, service-centric world. And that network effect is no longer application APIs. That network effect is broad hardware availability. Today, Linux really has reached a tipping point in terms of supporting almost every architecture known to man, All, you know, every SOC, you know, any kind of device. Uh, I hate to p keep picking on Greg, but I mean, the number of device that support that keep coming into the kernel is just unprecedented. Yet what this really does is anybody who's going to build anything is just de facto reaching to Linux because they already know that the hardware support is going to be there. Whether it's a watch, a wearable computing device, whether it's a smartphone, a tablet, a stereo, an automotive system, you name it. And I think that that trend is going to continue, that network effect is going to continue to have Linux and open source dominate the future of computing, where really all of this is abstracted, where functionality within the IT industry is abstracted into these services layers, and that's where underlying hardware support in any form really matters. And what we see there in this new IT economy is that the big winners are going to be people who focus their business around a service-centric model. Whether it's service providers themselves, like Amazon, or Google, or Facebook, or Twitter, or companies who are rejiggering and repositioning themselves to provide IT services or hardware and support into that services-centric model. Those are the big winners. And in addition, the big winners are all of you, open source developers who are really creating the underlying infrastructure that powers this big shift. You know, traditionally, open source has been that fast follower in every kind of IT trend that we've seen you know, prior to this time right now. But now we've reached this really interesting point we're now the default model for new areas of innovation, whether it's you know, the stuff that's going on at OpenStack, whether it's in software-defined networking, you know, projects like Open Daylight. You really have a new way of developing software where there's no central authority or control, where all of these organizations that are benefiting from these big IT trends are coming together and building their underlying infrastructure software together with no single corporate control point so that they can focus, if you're Twitter, on their users, or if, Facebook, if you're Facebook, on their users, or Amazon, or Google, or whoever. 
And that is a tremendous shift that's really helping Linux and open source. So what are the challenges in this environment? I promised to a few people that today I wouldn't just talk about how great Linux is and how all IT trends are helping Linux and open source, although I do think that is a point in fact. But there are big challenges for Linux, and I think they're worth noting as we start off this week and talk about how we as a community and as a collective industry can address them. First of all, the desktop continues to be something that Linux hasn't fulfilled a promise. I promised several people that I would stop making the year of the Linux desktop joke. I just did it again. I apologize. I can't help myself. But you know, let, let's, let's face the reality here, which is you know, Microsoft continues to have this amazing footprint on the desktop. Now, what I think is happening here is the desktop is just frankly less relevant. I think that's why you see Microsoft stock being punished. You know, you see the PC industry under tremendous pressure. And Android has certainly helped in making tablets and new ways of computing much better. But I think there's more work to be done there. And there's some promising signs. Chromebooks and other new types of form factors are making a big impact. Uh, I talked to somebody at Acer. They claim that Chromebooks now are 5 to 10 percent of its US, uh, US PC shipments. And while I think we're in early days there, as we move towards a web-centric model, as we move towards this sort of you know, centralized computing that you access from almost any device, that's going to help Linux. But we still have to focus on how we can make Linux a great desktop. Work from Companies like, uh, or projects like Ubuntu, Fedora, and others continue to do that work, but that I think is a challenge we need to overcome. Microsoft and .NET continue to have a strong footprint in the enterprise. Uh, what's interesting is there still is this big Windows footprint in the enterprise, but if you look at relative growth, what we're really seeing is Python, PHP, and Perl really growing exponentially. I think it'll be important for Linux and this community and all the different projects that make up underlying infrastructure to move towards those modalities and get people to move off of .NET. Another challenge for our community is legal issues. And this is primarily around scaling the legal community to support the adoption of free and open source software and support the collaborative development that's going to fuel all this technology and already is. Uh, I was talking to Evan Upton this morning about this, how you know, a lot of times the problem that rests with legal isn't that business decision makers haven't already decided to move towards an open source development model. It isn't even that there are not clear ways to use current legal structure to share the intellectual property you want to share, keep the intellectual property you want to keep. All of that works. The licenses work. We've kind of figured out a regime that makes it work. The problem is we just don't have enough lawyers who understand all of this to make it work as smooth as it could. We don't have enough automation to make license compliant as easy as it should be. You know, programs like SPDX should move faster so that we can have a standardized way of sharing open source license data across a wide variety of projects and products and really automate into the build tools the ability to comply with all of these legal requirements that just aren't that complicated at face value. And so this is going to be a challenge, and I think the Linux Foundation with our open compliance program wants to step up here. Another challenge for Linux and open source is going to be in emerging markets. These are the fastest growing technology markets in the world. In fact, this is where Linux is growing at an insane pace. But participation in the Linux development process and community and in the open source community at large needs to catch up with that adoption. We need to reach out to those different countries and geographies and help 
teach Chinese developers, let's say, hacker English so that they can participate if language is a barrier. Maybe we can adjust the culture of how development works so that it's easier for people from other cultures to participate in the process. But clearly, there's growth in these markets, and clearly, we can do more to reaching out to them. You know, I, I look just at the contest that we had to, you know, provide scholarships for people who wanted to learn more about Linux. It came, the, the biggest demand came from all these regions. Clearly, people there want to participate, want to learn. We should do more reaching out to them. Which leads me to the final big challenge, which is developers, finding more people like most of you. When I talk to organizations about how they can improve their use and participation of Linux or open source software, how they can improve their products, what their biggest problems are, the number one thing, and I don't care what company it is, whether it's Google, IBM, Qualcomm, Intel, you name it, the number one thing they say is, I need more developers. We're rolling out a whole host of training programs this year and next to try and get more developers to catch up with this insane demand for knowledge around Linux and open source software. What's crazy is, you know, if you actually learn this stuff, you're going to get a big pay bump. I think we need to do a better job getting that, I think, probably the biggest bottleneck for adoption of Linux and open source globally solved, and really that is getting developer resources to catch up with the actual adoption of Linux and open source. Now, the good news is these are all fairly good problems to have, right? They're all demand related. They're all problems because Linux and open source software is so insanely successful. But the question is, can we meet these challenges? Is this a permanent state of affairs? Will collaboration on a massive scale truly be the future of IT? Or will we regress back to sort of closed silos and proprietary software of the past? And you know, when I thought of this, I, I looked back 13 years uh, to uh, a video that I love that sort of, I think, pr predicted the place that we're at today and still illustrates how collectively, how learning from each other, we can go and solve all of these challenges. And I wanted to share that video with you today as we kick off this week so that hopefully it will inspire you to take Linux and open source software to even greater heights. So let's check it out. I think you should see this. It's just a kid. This is a G chord. He's learning, absorbing. He's getting smarter every day. Homo habilis was the first to use tools. A player who makes the team great is more valuable than a great player. Losing yourself in the group for the good of the group, that's teamwork. It's happening fast. We've always watched the stars. If you look at the sky, you can see the beginning of time. Collecting data is only the first step toward wisdom, but sharing data is the first step toward community. Poetry. There's not much glory in poetry, only achievement. Knowledge, amplification. What he learns, we all learn. What he knows, we all benefit from. One little thing can solve an incredibly complex problem. Everything's about timing, kid. This is business. Faster, better, cheaper. Constant improvement. So, you want to fly, huh? Wing speed, thrust. It's physics. Res publica non domine tu. Plummet. It's all about the tools. Speak your mind. Don't back down. Does he have a name? His name is Lennox. Thirteen years ago, I don't know if any... By the way, I apologize for the equality. I ripped that down off of YouTube. But that, that was 13 years ago when IBM invested a billion dollars in Linux. It was a Super Bowl ad. You know, I mean, I, I can throw a dart in a general direction and it hits a tech company 
that really is entirely created on top of this. I mean, I, you know, I literally opened up a newspaper thinking about how I would write this talk, and Twitter's IPO is right there, this, the, literally the most anticipated IPO this, this year, and all of it is built on free and open source software. That is a pretty amazing place today. I think we really have reached this point where what all of you have been doing for decades is now the default way of innovating. And that's a pretty great place to be.